Hi, welcome to Legal Vices. As we're taking this pause in the Johnny Depp trial, as I'm just getting started with this YouTube thing, I thought now would be a good time to sort of look into a couple of the lawyers that I admire. I won't use the term hero lawyers, but they're lawyers that I respect and admire for who they are, what they did, and what they accomplished in their lives. So to take on a little bit of a serious tone here, uh, I want to start out with a lawyer from very near my hometown in Utah. A, he has his office in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Jerry Spence. And some of the older people may remember Jerry Spence, but uh, maybe the younger crowd might not know him. He's a, he was a very famous lawyer back in the day. He represented huge clients, uh, Imelda Marcos, Randy Weaver from the Ruby Ridge standoff in 1992, uh, Karen Silkwood, the movie Silkwood was about that situation. He's, he's represented, in early on in his career, he was an insurance lawyer, uh, he worked as a prosecutor, and then as a defense lawyer after that. Um, he, has an, he had an amazing career, now he's 93 years old now, and he still practices part-time. Um, he, during the entire time he was a prosecutor and a defense lawyer, he never lost a single criminal case. And the last time he lost a civil case was 1969, the year I was born. Uh, he's a very famous lawyer out west. Um, people may remember him from providing commentary for CNN during the O.J. Simpson trial. Uh, he was a cowboy lawyer. We'd always wear a his deal was a leather jacket, leather cowboy jacket, Indian jacket with fringe, uh, usually wearing a cowboy hat. But I respect him for taking on the important matters, for fighting for the underdog. And he didn't always start out that way. Like I said, he was you know an insurance company lawyer. So he was always trying to uh, get the money for the big clients and to take it away from the people that really need it. But he had a life-changing experience that sort of shifted his focus and he devoted the rest of his career to helping ordinary people. And what I want to do is play a uh, about a 15-minute TED Talk that he gave a few years ago when he was 87. And watching this, you know, I think nowadays lawyers lack a lot of passion. We've lost the art of oration. We don't have the oratory skills we used to have. And Jerry Spence is a master orator, a master storyteller. He, he, he knows how to make the jury care enough to support his view and to find his way. And his, his, his demeanor, his attitude, his passion for what he does, I think is something that's a little bit lost as lawyers these days may tend to go through the motions. And I don't want to be critical of what's going on in the Johnny Depp trial now, but we did have uh, Camille Vasquez reading her opening statement. We've got the other lawyers sort of giving their blasé presentations, and Amber Heard's lawyer Elaine being needlessly vicious and ruthless. I think this some of this dynamic and some of the personal side of being a lawyer and actually truly believing and fighting and being passionate for your clients has been lost a little bit. Watch this video and please let me know what you think down in the comment section. And we'll do this uh, every now and then when uh, something crops up that I think may remind me of something that one of my favorite lawyers, one of my most respected lawyers comes up with. Please remember to like and subscribe I need to get used to saying that. It is important. It does mean a lot to me, and I'm so glad you're all here. Please enjoy this video, this TED Talk by Jerry Spence, and listen to his passion, listen to his oratory skills, and leave your comments on what you think. Thanks. I am here to tell you a story about an old man and a story about a young man. 
I'd like to start, first of all, by telling you that I was born in this wonderful state. And I began my life in Laramie, Wyoming. And I intend to end my life in Wyoming. Because this is a special place with special people that have become a part of me, that I am a part of them. To be anywhere else would be to be like ripping part of me out of the tree that we all are part of. I uh, remember 60 years ago when I began, over 60 years ago, when I began practicing law. I don't think there are very many of you who are, were around then. And at that time, if you were going to be a great lawyer, you couldn't be, you just couldn't be a person who represented the riffraff. You know, the, the riffraff was us. The riffraff were the people. The riffwaff were the ordinary people. If you were to become a great lawyer, you had to represent big money. You had to represent power. Well, 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 well. I uh, wanted to become a great lawyer. And so I began to learn how, because you don't learn how to, to try a case in law school, you only learn law. And then they, they kick you out, and you are, are then a licensed lawyer, and then people can come to you and pay you money to try a case and you don't know how to try the case. That's kind of the legal education that we got and the training that we got and the trainings today that lawyers are still getting. Let us be true about this. It's the non-training. It's the crime of our educational system that is so inverted that it cannot see what it is doing. And so, 60 some years ago, here comes this young whippersnapper that can win, win the world and I learned special ways by stacking up some losses like this. And I learned the ways that I could win on behalf of big money on behalf of, 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 of large corporations, on behalf of power. <laughs> I was on the side of power. I was on the side of those who needed me and they started to hire me across the land. This little country lawyer from Wyoming and uh, so it was, year after year, win after win, poor people, mothers who had lost children because of negligent care, fathers who were killed or, ba or maimed, who could never work a day of their life again, People who were lying in paraplegic beds, unable to move because of the negligence, and the carelessness, even the despise of other people who I represented and they walked out of our courts of justice with nothing. One day, 
I was given a case to defend brought by an old man. He was a nice old man. I could see that from the beginning. He had a kind face. And uh, he had been run into by this, this lady who I was assigned to defend. And behind her was all of this big money. And nobody would be permitted to know that under our system. The money behind the client that you are suing is not permitted to go to the jury. So the jury just saw this little lady there. And what did I do to that nice old man? Well, let me tell you something. He had worked all his life in a stinking refinery. Your entire working life in the smell and the grime and the grease and the... Oh, and, and looking forward to the day when you could retire. That's what he did. He looked for the day he could retire and take his grandchildren out into the beautiful wilderness that you and I enjoy almost every day. That was his goal. But Apple Annie was drunk, and she ran into him, and she crippled him so badly that he could hardly walk. And he could, every step was a painful step. And I began to do my thing with this old man. And I did things in cross-examination. I was kind to him, but I would show little discrepancies in what he had said in a deposition, which is a sworn statement, and what he was saying now. And they weren't big discrepancies, but one of the things that I had learned to do was to take little things and make them big and to take big things and make them little until it came to the point where the jury returned a verdict against the old man. Now what did that mean? That meant that he would go the rest of his life in pain. The doctor said he would never recover from his pain and his crippledness. He would never be able to go out into the wilderness like we do with his grandchildren. His dream was crushed. And in place of his dream was given pain and disability for the rest of his days. Because I represented Apple Annie, who had all of this powerful money behind her. After the trial, my little chickadee, Imogene, and I went to the grocery store to get some goodies to celebrate. And I happened to look behind, and we were waiting to be checked out. And here was this old man behind me. Do you understand? And I came face to face with him now, like this. And I said, I'm sorry, sir, what happened to you today? And his 
face was gentle, in his eyes quiet, and even loving. And he said to me, Oh, that's all right, Mr. Spence. You were just doing your job. And that evening, I said to Imogene, Is that my job? To deprive people who are entitled to justice out of justice because I can? So that night I laid in bed, twisting and turning and thinking, and I could see that old man's face. And then I could see his loving, caring, forgiving eyes. And in the morning, I fired all of the companies that I represented. And it was not easy for me, but I began to find ways to make up for all of my, well, should I call it what the, it was? I found ways to make up for all of my sins. The sin of depriving people out of justice when they were entitled to it. And I thought to myself, I have to do more because there are no co colleges in this country and there are none today. Hear me say this, there are no colleges, no universities in this country today that teach people's lawyers. That is, lawyers who fight for the rights of people like you. Ordinary people who go down the life of their lives doing the right thing and suddenly one day they wake up and they have been injured or their loved ones have been injured or they've been charged with crimes that they haven't committed. It never happens to any of us, does it? until it happens. And I established this college called Trial Liars College, and it is a pro bono, tax-free institution that is non-profit, makes no profit, and we take only cases we try only lawyers who represent people. We don't represent corporations. We don't represent big money. We don't represent anybody except ordinary people, just people. And I'm still fighting. And I expect to continue to fight for the rest of my days. And so now, what is this all about, this, this talk? What is the bottom line that I'm trying to illustrate to you? I want you to see the pebble. The pebble is the old man who said to me, that's all right, Mr. Spence. You were just doing your job. It is the pebble of the old man who looked at me and could forgive me, who could still love me. And that pebble has been thrown in to the quiet waters of history. And that pebble from that old man has caused wave after wave 
after wave. We have touched thousands and thousands of people. And those lawyers, we have trained thousands and thousands of them. And they have represented and are fighting for the rights of ordinary people. And they have done it with thousands, thousands of them. How many of the simple pebble of an old man who had been deprived of justice could love and forgive and the power of that as it goes on 